Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. Now, if you're a morning person, then uh, you've seen our next guest all over your television. Uh, of course, as the co-anchor of NBC's Today Show or MSNBC's Morning Joe. And most recently, you can catch him as anchor of Sunday Today with Willie Geist. The show recently celebrated its second anniversary and provides a sharp conversational coverage of the day's news and gathers fresh voices for a Sunday discussion of everything from politics to pop culture. He's also just launched recently the Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast, which offers uncut full-length interviews and conversations with guests like Emily Blunt, uh, Chadwick Boseman, and yes, Bill Murray. Uh, he's a busy guy for sure, and I'd say I honestly don't know how he found the time to come hang out with us, but it's 11 a.m., and after 20 years of working morning shows, I'm pretty sure that's like 4.30 in the afternoon for him. So he's probably just trying to stay awake. I'm super excited he's here. The great Willie Geis is in the house, ladies and gentlemen. How do we feel about that? Huh? That's amazing. You are correct. You are correct to applaud as such. Uh, but before we bring him out, we're going to do it in just a second. But before we do, we have a quick look at the show. So Luke, let's go ahead and uh, run that clip. Are you aware, Bill, of the mythology that surrounds you, that there are websites about your exploits showing yeah. up at bachelor parties? There's a documentary coming out trying to verify know, all the stories about you. Yeah, and they want me to be in it. I'm like, I don't, <laughs> what? A documentary about myself? I think I'll wait till after I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. but, but do you realize that there's a Bill Murray thing, that <clears> he, <throat> might, he might turn up at your wedding and do a picture Right, and you? I get a lot of wedding invitations. But, yeah. I don't know what to make of it. It's I'm not. There's no plan there. I don't have. This wasn't my plan. It feels kind of nice, you know. You know, people like like you, whatever. But you know, I'm just. There's no plan because this exists. This kind of thing exists now. I can't like. Okay, well, I've got. Gee, I've got to work on my mythology stuff this afternoon. You know, it's like <laughs> you, know, you can't. You can't like. Oh Jesus! What am I doing about my myth, Han? What am I doing about the myth today? <laughs> it's not like that, you know, it's just... Well, what goes through your mind, let's say there's a couple taking wedding pictures in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm. You see him over there. You could keep walking, nobody would notice you. When you drop in on those photos, what are you thinking? Well, that kind of a thing is like you just look and you go, oh my God, there's two people that are in love, really mm. in love. And there's a difference. There's people that are getting married and there's people that are in love. Those people were in love. And it's extraordinary just to get in the space of them. But that's got to feel good to be the guy who, it, when it, he shows up. It's kind of fun. It's exciting it, fun. and happy. Yeah, it's fun to drop in um, like that and the same, you know, but you don't want it to, like to change the event, you know, you don't want it to change it and like, oh, you don't want it to be about you. It's just, it's just sort of fun to jump on those things every once in a while. So cool. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise. The great Willie Geist. Come on. How's it going? Oh, man. I, this is wonderful. Willie, thank you so much for being here, man. And, Thanks for uh, having me. Can I come in, first of all? Yeah, please do. The bar in the green room? Oh, yeah. Sensational. 11 o'clock in the morning. They've got every scotch you've ever heard of. There's Drambuie. <laughs> there are liqueurs I've never heard of. I haven't had any of them yet. I'm going to wait till after the show, but good for you on that bar. Thank you. For, and if I may, if I may toot my own horn, the fine selection of assorted nuts and, and dry snacks. Incredible. Yeah, well, we try to take care of you. Yeah, dry trail mix, all kinds of We've good We've got dry it all stuff. back there. I also want to point out, I have more than one pair of shoes. These okay. were the same shoes I had on in the Bill Murray interview. Yeah. It's purely coincidental. I do have a second pair of sneakers. That's cool. Well, I was I was going to ask you that. I'm comforted by that knowledge. <laughs> Willie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. I want to get into that Bill Murray interview. Uh, I want to talk about Sunday today, two years, the whole nine. Before we do any of that, the beauty of Bill is we do have a couple of minutes to be here. So I always love to start uh, just very simply. Like, how are you? How is Willie? How are you doing, man? Oh, I didn't know this was like uh, the Sopranos, like sitting on the couch. Yeah, man, we're going to go deep. You're Lorraine Bracco, I, uh, and I'm and Gandolfini. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I got um, two great kids. I got a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. I got a job I love, two jobs I love, doing Sunday Today, talking to people like Bill Murray every week, and then during the week I do Morning Joe, where I get to talk about the biggest story in the world, and that is the presidency of Donald Trump. So I'm good. How could I complain? Life is good. Uh, that's that's fantastic news, man. And, uh, you know, I, actually, I want to I wanna touch on something you just mentioned. You have two fantastic jobs. 
uh, and for a while now in your career, you've you've been the morning guy. You've worked a lot of mornings. Yeah. I know this is such a dumb thing for me to ask and open with, but I'm genuinely curious. What's your body clock like at this point? Like, when are you going to bed and waking up? Not a dumb question. <laughs> it's the first thing everybody asks me. Yeah. And I used to ask that too. Like, how do you guys pull that off? I've done it for. I started Morning Joe 11 years ago, so I've really been on this schedule for 11 years. I get up at 4:30. Um, but I'm not good at going to bed. Like, I should go to bed at 9 or 9.30. I probably go to bed closer to 10.30. Last night, I think I went to bed at 11. So, but it's not a complaint. It's just a fact of, of, of life. And I think people said, well, you probably get used to it over 11 years. You don't really get used to it. Nobody gets used to that, but you learn how to manage it. Yeah. So it's, okay, I've got to eat at 10 a.m., or I've got to go to the gym at this certain time. You have to, like, just keep the ball in the air until be till bedtime comes again. And especially if you have to do something at night, like last night and the night before, I've got to go out and do an event or something. And you really have to start over another day. Like, take another shower, have something to eat, and pretend, just trick your body into thinking, like, all right, we're starting this thing over again. I just have this image of you going on vacations with the family, waking everybody up. Come on, it's 3.30 in the oh, morning. Oh, I do we that. Do no, no. Well, not 3.30, but I think... I What's the earliest you've ever made everybody else get up? Well, I get up at probably like five or like I'll stretch it to six later in the yeah. week because your body starts to get a little more comfortable. But I am always like I've been out here on the terrace trying not to wake you up for the last three hours while my kids are asleep. That's pretty fun. Well, thank you for, for indulging me on in that question. Of uh, course. So I was just very curious about the lifestyle. Uh, as I mentioned, and we talked briefly about this backstage, the, the Bill Murray thing is fantastic. We got to see a great clip of that. And uh, I listened to the podcast earlier this week and, and, and heard the whole conversation. Uh, talk to me. How... How'd that all come about? You mentioned that Bill said, I want to do that thing. But yeah. did you guys have to call the 800 number from there? Like, what, what was the process leading up to so that? So for people who don't know, to get in touch with Bill Murray, he does not carry a cell phone. He doesn't have a publicist. He doesn't have a manager. You have to call a 1-800 number <laughs> where he has an old school voicemail system. It's like an answering machine from the 80s. And you call and you say, hi, uh, Bill, this is the NBC Today Show. We'd like to do an interview with you. We think that'd be great. And here's why you should do it. You might hear back. You might not hear back if he's interested. And by the way, it's not just to book him on a TV show. If Wes Anderson wants Bill Murray to be in Isle of Dogs, Same he's calling the 1-800 number. It's crazy. So he did. I will say, this wasn't in the interview, but he showed me he has a BlackBerry. Yeah. But it's just for, he has six sons. And it's just for family and super, super, super close friends that he oh. might re respond quicker. So we left a message for my show for Sunday. We didn't hear back. He did come in to do a weekday Today Show live interview, so four or five minutes. And he walked into the green room, and all of our bookers were there on the Today Show, and he said, I want to do that Willie Geist show. And they all went, oh, you do? We never heard back after we left the 1-800 thing, and you didn't say anything. He said, yeah, well, I want to do it. And so I, was, I couldn't do it in that moment because I was interviewing somebody else for the show. Luckily, he was sticking around, and he said, have him come to the hotel at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So I went to his hotel at 10 o'clock the next morning. There's a little bar, like a rooftop bar, set up some lights, cameras, and he gave us an hour of his time, and there was no rush. Because when you don't have a publicist, there's nobody over your shoulder going, wrap it up. You just vibe with him until you feel like he's, he's done. So it was great. That's you know, and you've talked about this before. That Bill Murray, for you, for a lot of people, he's the white whale. He's the one that you want to get. It's impossible to find him, track him down. You got him. You landed him. How do you prepare for that moment? Have you been preparing your whole life? Yeah. Like well, that is a funny thing. I, I remember I interviewed um, Mick Jagger a few years ago, and I was raised on the Rolling Stones. My dad, my uncles, everybody loved the Rolling Stones. And I remember at first being like, you're nervous. It's Mick Jagger. And this guy, he's been an icon in your house. And I sat down across from him, and something happened, to your point, where I went, wait a minute, there's nothing to be nervous about. I know everything about this person. Yeah. There's nowhere this conversation could go that I won't be ready for it to go. And I kind of feel that way about Bill Murray. I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s. So Caddyshack and Ghostbusters and What About Bob and Groundhog Day and Kingpin and all the movies um, were just part of, you know, we can recite every line. So yeah. there was no, there's no nerves about it. I think the only wild card is like, you want to make sure he's into it, and you suck him in, and you show him it's going to be okay. And I think that takes a few minutes. And then when he sees, all right, this is a, a safe place where I can give a long answer and tell a story, and um, all of a sudden it just—it was the same thing, like with Mick Jagger. You just go.
Yeah, so, and you can sort of, as someone who does these uh, with such somewhat regularity, as I'm listening to yours, I can hear you sort of sussing them out. I'm going to start with the with the movie stuff. We'll get them comfortable, yeah. Yeah. and then you start you start massaging the conversation. And then you land a big one, which was I was fascinated by him talking about the mythology, him talking about Garfield, yeah. all these different things. Yeah. In your head, are you quietly freaking out? We're doing it. <laughs> We're getting it. This is this this is the stuff. Well, you're right, and you know because you do this, you can sense right away yeah. if somebody throws up the wall and they're giving you short answers and. Yeah. You can, like, you've sort of blown it, and this is going to be a short interview. But he was, I guess the fact that he asked to do it showed a good a first step. Like, I think this is going to be okay. I've heard it's okay. So he knew it was probably going to be all right for him. And then as we talked and we had a good conversation and we were born in the same hospital in Chicago and all these other things that we sort of had in common, um, you know, we, we did a bunch on his career. But, you know, you also want to be careful not asking the cliche stuff, you know, like, can you recite a line from Caddyshack? Can you say the thing about the Dalai Lama being a big hitter? You don't want to be that guy. No. There's fanboying out. So you try to find more interesting parts of his life and career to ask about. But yeah, when I saw it was going OK, I was like, let's talk about the mythology, the thing where you crash weddings and bachelor parties. And like, why do you do that? Do you think about doing it? And I had never heard him talk about it. I really hadn't. And I could see that he was happy and willing and maybe even excited to explain what had happened in all those different cases. Yeah. Is fantastic. Uh, so let me ask you this: you, you had about an hour with him, which is uh, incredible. But a guy like that, you can talk to for yeah. six, seven, eight. You can talk to for a whole whole week. <laughs> like, there's no end. Were there things in in the back of your head that you really wanted to get to with him? You didn't have time. You couldn't find a way in. You walked away going, "Damn!" So yeah, close. I think we probably skipped chunks of his career. I mean. The truth is, I could have done an hour on Caddyshack with him, or an hour on Ghostbusters, and that becomes one question or a part of a question. Right. So, yeah, I mean, if in a perfect world, if I had like an eight-part series with Bill Murray, we could do a whole one on, on Caddyshack. But he, you know, we didn't get into some of the. We kind of jumped from the '80s when his career and life blew up, and then got to sort of Mount Rushmore and Lost in Translation. I try to find sort of turning points in their lives and careers, and obviously, Lost in Translation, when he was nominated for an Oscar in a dramatic role, was like an entirely different thing for him. And I think Hollywood looked at him a little bit differently. And now he's been in um, eight Wes Anderson movies since he did Rushmore, all the way up to Isle of Dogs. So. Um, but, you know, again, even like the SNL stuff he got into a little bit because that that can be a trite thing, like all the drugs in the 70s and tried to take it to a different place. And then he started telling the Rolling Stones story of like when he, you know, the st they went to an after party and he, they met the Stones on the show. And he goes, and the next thing you know, it's seven hours later and you're p passing a bottle of Rebel Yell back and forth in a restroom with Keith Richards. Um, so those stories, that's gold. That's great. And, it, and they, they really are. And you, you do have this this knack when you do a conversation, when you have a conversation and you engage with somebody, you do get those stories that, that we haven't heard before. You know, with him, it's difficult because, one, nobody really gets to talk to him that often. And when he does, you do kind of get the same stuff. But you, you opened up a whole treasure trove. You know what? It helps, too, is that we do have an hour with these people. Yeah. If he came on, and he did, if he comes on the Today Show and it's a live interview, He's standing over there. We haven't even spoken yet. We go to a commercial break for three minutes. He runs out. He sits down. You say, how you doing? Good. The movie's great. You sit down. And then it's three or four questions about the movie and what it was like to work with Wes again. And there's no opportunity to tell the Rolling Stones story. There's no opportunity for him to bitch about the Garfield movies he was in for 20 minutes. So I, you know, I have the benefit of time, which makes all the difference. Which, uh, perfect segue into the launch of this podcast that you guys have just started doing recently, uh, the Sunday sit down. Uh, have you and we have you always had that much time with the guests? Because it, it makes so much sense to take that full uncut thing. That's the perfect channel for it. It's the perfect place for it, uh, and they're doing really well right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I we have for the Sunday show. We've always had that much time, but it varies. You know, some people say you can only have thirty minutes. Whatever their publicist said, we always stretch that longer because we think the conversation is going well enough that we can extend it. And then some of them are. You spend a day at somebody's house in Nashville, it's hours long. So it can vary. But for me, the appeal of doing the Sunday show when I started two years ago was that I could do these longer interviews. And in TV time, that meant seven or eight minutes instead of three or four minutes. But still, even at seven or eight minutes, if you're talking to somebody for an hour, there's 53 minutes left on the floor. And you're going, oh, my God, there's this incredible story they told that no one's ever going to hear. So that's the frustration of it. So... I've been saying for a while, and we, we put it into place for the second anniversary, let's just put it all up as a podcast. 
And so it, I think it helped to have Bill Murray be the first one. Yeah. But we also posted our last four interviews. So we had Emily Blunt and John Goodman and Chadwick Boseman for Black Panther and another one that I can't think of. Um, I can't think of it. But we had, so we put five up at once. And I, uh, so we put them up on Sunday. And to my surprise, on Monday, I went on the Apple podcast yeah. thing. And I said, well, let's just see if we made the top 100. That'd be fun if we could say we were in, on the list. Exactly. And so I'm scrolling down, I get to like 40 and 50 and 70. I'm like, oh man, that's kind of a bummer, but whatever, we're just starting. So then I go back to the top and it was number one. Number one. But I hadn't even thought to look there. I just yeah, began that right really right. long scroll first, no like wheel. just a big follow through on my finger on that scroll. <laughs> and then I went back to the, and it was number one and it was for a couple of days. So that was really cool and, and told me that if you have the right person in the right format, um, yeah. people love that stuff. People that, respond to it, yeah. I'm sure it resonates. So, you know, two years, uh, it's a heck of a milestone for, for any show to, to be successful for two whole years on television. When you think back uh, to, to the first week of shooting, how, how has the show evolved and changed? What's the biggest thing you think you guys have evolved over the time? Well, I think when you start a new show, and especially under the Today Show umbrella, which is an institution that's been around for 65 years, there's the balance between preserving the tradition and the brand of the Today Show and wanting to do something new with it. And so when I started the show, I kind of wanted it to be a combination of Morning Joe, my weekday life, which is sort of a round table discussion show, and the you know, more classic magazine format with these long pieces we do, a little more Today Show. And so it ended up being a weird sort of Frankenstein's monster, I think. So I think what we arrived at after a few months was the audience needed to know when they turned it on that it was the Today Show. Because I, I came out one week, and the week before it had been the Today Show they'd known for 65 years, and here I was, and we were like, what am I watching? I didn't even know if this is still the Today Show. Yeah. So we kind of went back a little closer to the Today Show, but without compromising any of the long format and the pieces and all the things we do. So it's different. I think also, you know, with these interviews, you just get more comfortable doing them, you know? Um, you know how to approach them a little bit better. Um, so hopefully they've gotten better over time and um, worthy of something that you would listen to 45 minutes of on a podcast. Do you remember uh, uh, the moment in which you started to feel uh, uh, a greater comfort in going into these interviews? With, you know, when, when, that turn, when you turned that corner, how long ago that was? How yeah, I mean, the good news is I'd been doing the Today Show before that for six or seven years. So I like it wasn't that it was uncomfortable, but... I never really got an hour with somebody before. Right. So to me, it was like, you don't have to rush into the, the whatever they're promoting. You don't have to rush into the interview. You can kind of just take it slow at the beginning, get to know them a little bit, build a little trust with them, and then you draw out the, the more interesting things later on. So I don't know. I think it, our first guest ever on the show was Leslie Odom from Hamilton, who played Aaron Burr in Hamilton, and that was in the middle of Hamilton mania two years ago. It was the biggest thing in the world. So that was very exciting. And then my second guest was Ice Cube. And, and we went. he was in town. We rented a 64 Impala, and I drove around Harlem with... Ice Cube, and it was like these crazy, like they let little pieces of your childhood dreams are coming true in front of you. So I, I just think it's reps. I don't, I can't think of a particular specific interview where it changed, but I just think every time, still, still, every time you get a little better. For sure. You know, uh, speaking of Morning Joe, uh, it's the show Sunday today, but it, it doesn't all happen on Sunday. You work on it throughout the week to make it get there. How do you, how do you navigate those, those two obligations and, and float between those two different worlds? Well, so Morning Joe's on from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., so that's a pretty finite window that you know you have. And then, you know, at night, there's a good amount of preparation before I go to bed. You sit on the computer for an hour and suss through what we're going to talk about the next day. And in the space in the middle, I'm working on um, ideas for the Sunday show, or we're booking guests, or I'm writing the show because I write the, the show on Sunday. And... Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a balance, and a lot of times you've got to run out and do an interview. You know, we did, you know, it's kind of a feast or famine thing. I think in two weeks we did six of these big profiles. It's just like who's around, who's in town, what's your need, and then you sort of like chill for a while, and then we'll ramp up again like next week. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's a fine balance. I, uh, one of my deals was if I'm going to do Morning Joe during the week and Sunday, I'm not actually going to come into the office on Saturday because I have to see my children yeah. one day a week, maybe, and go to like their baseball game. Um, 
So I, but it's not a day off. You do a call in the morning, you do some writing, you check in again before, you got to go to bed early and all that stuff. So it's a packed schedule, but I asked for it and I wanted it. And I've got a Today Show with my name on it where I kind of get to do whatever I want. And so it's a lot, but it's a, it's a good balance. And my philosophy always has been to just add to the plate until you, yeah. <laughs> until you physically can't eat anymore. You know, sure. keep going back to the buffet. It's a very Italian mentality, <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask, you know, we mentioned Morning Joe a bunch of times, and recently, uh, and this also ties back to the Bill Murray thing, Morning Joe, uh, they did an SNL bit, and you were part of that bit. Like, they, they parodied you. Yes. You came away unscathed, but still, i got to imagine that's both a, uh, a terrifying and hilarious moment for you when you realize this has happened. Well, I was saying to you, so I go to bed. As I said, I have to go to bed a little earlier than I used to on Saturday nights now, and to wake up <laughs> early in the morning, and it's just text text say oh my god snl snl and all the tweets and you're like oh dear god do i do i dare look and they've done it twice now they've yeah. done morning joe twice now and i end up sort of just being a v they're not trying very hard with they me in fact i'd like lauren wardrobe hair makeup everybody try a little harder with my character <laughs> they got harder. joe and mika down got yeah, that oh, they Rush Kate McKinnon those. does Mika. And then I'm just kind of a throwaway over here who they use to ask questions of. Actually, Bill Murray was in one of those. He was playing Steve Bannon, and I was like asking him questions across. So I think it's Mikey Day yeah, who, Mikey who plays is, me. Is the Love the does. guy. I think he's funny. I just like to see you exert a little more effort <laughs> in, my, in my look. I can help you with the hair, whatever you need. Let's talk. Do, have your kids seen the, the SNL version of Dad? Yeah, they're like that. It's supposed to be you? That doesn't look anything like you. Yeah. But they love SNL, so they think it's just cool. Yeah. It, there aren't many things they acknowledge are cool about me, professionally or personally. <laughs> so when they heard that, they're like, you were in it. Oh, OK. All we'll right. give you that one, Dad. That's one. We're going to give you one. Yeah. Didn't you do the voiceover for, uh, what was it? I want to say Kung Fu, Kung Fu Panda. Panda with I, don't even, I don't even get that, though. They don't get No. That. No. So Kung Fu Panda 3, yeah. Al Roker and I were cousins of Jack Black's <laughs> character. We were called Dim and Sum. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I was Dim. And Al and I went in and did an entire day of voiceover. We read, we were all physical, yeah. and like, we're, wow, you know, you've seen those behind the scenes thing. Oh, totally. And that was us, and we're like, this is amazing. So we go to the premiere, we're like, we're in this movie. They, we, my daughter brought all her friends from school. We had like 25 seats blocked off. Yeah. Al brought his whole family. Yeah. And we get, we watched the movie, and we the only thing they had of us was just us going, Wahoo! <laughs> and no spoken words. We were in there for an entire day. And so the movie ended, and Al and I were like, ooh, boy. We are looking around at these, like, 50 kids that we brought to the movie, and they were like, was your dad in this, Lucy? And then luckily my name was in the credits to prove that I had screamed yeah. that line. So I've been given grief now for like three years since then. They're like, you were not in that movie. Yeah, you, were, yeah, yeah. you were not in that movie. So I pretend I, they, they, it annoys them. I'm like, you know, it was so fun working with Jack and Angie. Because they're so real offset, and it's really about their families more than anything else, and their kids are great. The twins, I think there's some twins in there somewhere. Um, so my kids get very annoyed when I talk about being a big movie star in Kung Fu Panda 3. That's pretty Rightfully amazing. so, yeah. There's, I mean, th those are fantastic stories, but I think just uh, it, it is a dad's destiny to not be cool. Like, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like, I know. Like, is, is there a cool dad? Are there any, like, Brad Pitt's kids? Are they like, well, you know what, actually... You're cool. I, I think at that point they've got to accept that their dad's pretty cool. Right? But they don't, right? We know they don't. Like LeBron, LeBron's kids, LeBron's kids. Fair. Yeah, there you go. I think maybe they know he's cool, right? How, much how do more, you not know that? How much more could a human possibly do? Right. You know what I mean? Like at what point? Blue Ivy. Does Blue Ivy not think Beyonce is cool? Because she's wrong. Because <laughs> she's wrong. And she'll always be wrong if she but, thinks uh, that. Right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, talking about Blue Ivy and that family, is that one of your dream gets? Now that you've had Bill Murray, yeah. where does the list go yes. at this point, right? Jay-Z and Beyonce are right near the top. And I would take them separately. I would take them together. I would take them with Blue Ivy. I would take them however they want to wanted do it. In any capacity. I grew up in New Jersey across the river on in the suburbs on hip-hop in the 80s when it was first, like, leaking oh, out man. to the suburbs. And so um, he came. he came a little after that, obviously, but he would be... He's always been at the top of the list. He's pretty selective in the things he does. You do get to a point, which is like the Jay-Z, Beyonce zone, where it's like, yeah, I don't really need to do press because yeah, exactly. I'm me and people are just going to buy it. So yeah. I don't have to worry about that. Um, but I would love to talk to them. Um, Mark Zuckerberg I would love to do. 
We've done a ton of CEOs on the Sunday show. We've done the Instagram guys, Jack Dorsey at Twitter, um, Airbnb, Brian Chesky, The Lift, Brian Zimmer. Um, we've done all those guys, but not Zuckerberg. He's a little more bubble wrapped than the rest of them. Um, but given especially the last couple of weeks, I'd love to talk to him. We talk to a lot of people these days. Yeah, it seems to Ex- yeah I know. I How about us? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then Mick Jagger, I gotta go back to Mick. I gotta get because he hasn't done. I've interviewed him, but that wasn't for the Sunday show. So I needed him or Keith Richards. I would take as well. Yeah. Or together, right? Yeah, both. Sure, both. the Glimmer Twins. Well, you know, it's a, yeah, and uh, as you do uh, all these different people, now you got the bl- the, the Bill Murray chip, right? So you know, well, Bill yeah. Murray's done the show. Yes, and that's got to help. That's not a bad one. Yeah, I, w- I mean, I've got. Not a lot of people have that. We've chip. got the Bill Murray chip. We've done President George W. Bush. Like we've got some people at the level where you can, we yeah, can be like, yeah, presidents yeah. and Bill Murray have done this show. Yeah, not, you should not too, <laughs> Beyonce. Exactly. Yeah. She does watch the show. We haven't had her on, but I know she watches. Huge fan. I know. Yeah. You religious. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's not to discredit the chips you already had. You have amazing chips, but that Bill Murray chip. That might be the that's chip. That's a coveted chip. Be, in fact, we did two parts on his interview. It's usually just one isolated segment, and it was our two-year anniversary. And I was like, "There's, there, we got it." So I think we ended up doing like 11 minutes of Bill Murray, which in TV time is nuts, nuts so. Yeah, but still not enough. That's why we have the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of not enough time, uh, I got to turn it over. I promised the audience they'd get to ask okay. questions. Uh, I believe we have some microphones out there. We're going to take our first one right here. Who does your couches, by the way? Is it a Ray Moore and Flanagan situation? <laughs> it's a nice. It looks good. They're comfy too. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan. Thank you. Um, I grew up watching your dad on TV as well. Talk about cool dads. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the lessons you learned from your dad growing up? He is a cool guy. He is a cool guy. Um, you know, my dad worked hard. Um, he was not, not in any way uh, vain. He came up as a newspaper writer, so he has none of that, like, cliche TV ego thing. And that's a really good lesson that, like, you can do a good job and just separate yourself from all that garbage. And he, you know, people always ask me if, he, you know, I'm in TV because of him. He and I never had a conversation about that ever. In fact, he encouraged me when I graduated college because I was kind of into doing TV because I'd intern the summer before. He, like, he made me, <laughs> there were guys in our town in New Jersey who worked on Wall Street, so I had to, like, go out to lunch with Mr. McGillicuddy who worked at, you know, J.P. Morgan. And I was like, what? I had nothing about <laughs> finance or math or whatever they do there. And then... Uh, and then my mom made me go up to um, Hartford, Connecticut to sit down with a family friend who worked at Northwest Mutual Insurance. And again, I was like, what? Um, so they like sort of tried to, they wanted me to know what else was out there. But he never had the conversation with me, except that I watched him. You know, And I watched that he got to travel to cool places and meet interesting people. He always had stories to tell. You know, when we were sitting at uh, parties or at a dinner table, he was always the guy with something interesting to say. And he liked his job. You know, I think, like, that's a huge thing that people overlook. He didn't, like, trudge home on the bus every day and go, oh, God, that was awful. He would come home on the bus and be like, look at this person I met today, you know. And it started when he was a writer at the Chicago Tribune. Then he was a columnist at the New York Times. And then CBS actually, because they someone Don Hewitt who started 60 Minutes liked his column, and they said, "You ever thought about doing TV?" And he said, "No." And they said, "Why don't we shoot a pilot using one of your columns as the sort of the source for the piece?" And they liked it, and he moved to CBS. So my point is, he didn't come up. That's not a guy who like grew up like wearing makeup and hairspray and like, "Where do you want me? How's my lighting?" He didn't know any of that stuff. He was just a guy who liked telling stories. So. Um, I think his example was the best lesson. Very cool. That was a great question. Thank you. We've got time for a few more. Next one appears to be right over here. This hey. is the infirmary over here. It is indeed. <laughs> yeah. Brothers and arms. Um, I was going to say, uh, when you look at uh, the years you spent in journalism and specifically the work you do on Morning Joe, yeah. what would you feel was a big threat to reporting the news these days? Or what do you feel is a bigger threat when you look at certain administrations promoting the truth is fake yeah. and promoting the idea of alternative facts or the sections of population that are blindly willing to accept something as fake news yeah. without doing any research. Well, I think the biggest threat is just the complete undermining of trust in the press and the undermining of trust in, by the way, the FBI and the Justice Department. It's a, you know, it's a strategy. It's a strategy that the president has. It's a strategy that the administration has 
which is to make you think every time you hear something, you better consider the source. Remember, that's the same media that lied to you about this, so you better not believe this. Or that's the same FBI that Robert Mueller used to lead, so you're really going to trust the findings of his investigation. So I think from our side of it is we can't do anything to prove that correct. We can't feed that narrative. We have to be extra diligent with our facts and getting to the truth and not being petty and not playing fast and loose and, and falling into narratives. We just have to tell the truth as we know it. So like the president had a news conference with the Japanese prime minister yesterday and he said a bunch of things that weren't true. And so we just, rather than from where I sit and it's not everyone's approach, rather than coming out of that and being snarky or whatever, just detail, go through them and, and, and here's what he said and here's what's actually true. There's always gonna be a segment of the population who thinks we're not trustworthy and I think there have been cases over the years where we've maybe earned um, some of the criticism that we get in terms of bias. But um, it's incumbent upon us now, I think, to just be, just nail everything down and get your story straight and get your facts straight so that you don't give them the opportunity to say, see, there they go again. It's not gonna work with everybody because there are people who, who love him and follow him and believe him and whatever he says goes and whatever Bob Mueller finds out, they're gonna think it, they're not gonna believe it because he's planted the seed. It's a hoax, there's no collusion, it's a plot because they lost the election and he's, you know, whatever you wanna say about President Trump, he's, um, he's a master at, at messaging and he has been from his days in TV and he can say something enough that enough people believe it, that it throws a, a wrench into the system. So I think we just have to work harder than ever to make sure we've got our facts straight. Thank you, another great question. We've got time to get the signal one more and that's gonna come from right here. Hi, how you doing? Um, I was just wondering what your uh, path was to becoming a TV personality and host and was there anybody that you kind of modeled your career or, uh, or uh, you know, yeah, just models your yeah. career out of? Yeah, it's, um, it's probably a longer story than we have time for, because everyone's like, what's the path? I'm gonna follow that, but everyone has a weird a path. But I was, I actually was not on camera until um, 2005. I was a producer on a primetime show on MSNBC. I'd been a sports producer out of college, actually an editor first, editing highlights, working nights, weekends, holidays, everything, because that's when the games are. Um, I worked at a sports network. They unplugged the network. It's called CNN Sports Illustrated. Then I worked for a little group called CNN Sports. And then I moved up to New York and worked for um, a very brief time at uh, Fox Sports on a, t on a sports talk show there that I'd moved up to New York for. They canceled it nine months later. I was out of a job. This is the very short version of this. Out of a job, hopped over because a friend of mine knew somebody and got a freelance job at MSNBC, like pr producing with a couple other people on a new show. They hired us full time. I was a producer on the show. They were trying to figure out what we should do in the last three minutes of the show. And the host of the show was like, well, Willie and I get along. Why doesn't he just come out and we'll, you know, we'll talk about whatever we want to talk about. And I was like, oh, okay. So I literally would go out of the control room with my headset around my neck and talk for, for three minutes about stories we missed, something we got wrong, what's coming up tomorrow, whatever that yeah. we decided to do. And from that, because it was fun and had a little something to it, um, like Keith Olbermann asked me to do a piece for his show, Countdown on MSNBC. And then when Joe Scarborough, my current co-host, had a primetime show, he had me do pieces for that show. And then the Weekend Today show said, hey, we like those things you do for Keith Olbermann. Can you come do one like that for the weekend? And so it's just, and I'm still a producer this whole time. These are just extra little gigs. And then the real turning point was, in April of 2007, 11 years ago, like right now, um, Don Imus had a radio show that was simulcast on MSNBC from 6 to 9 a.m. And he said something horrible about the Rutgers women's basketball team. You can look it up. And he was fired. And so the next day, they had three hours to fill in the morning on MSNBC. And when I tell you they were like, putting anyone on the air, it was like if you had an NBC ID, they were like, go do an hour, we need help. <laughs> Fill in the chair, go, yeah. So that, so that was sort of a long audition period and the result of it a few months later was that Joe moved from his primetime show, I moved off being a producer on the show I was working on and Mika 
um, joined us, and the three of us were Morning Joe, and that was 11 years ago. And then from Morning Joe, I got opportunities on the Today Show and hosted that show for a long time, too. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to say, like, people are like, should I go work in the small market, or should I, how do I get in, what do I do? And everybody's story is so different. Now, I do think there are so much more opportunities now, like platforms, you know, like this, or... Um, you know, at, at NBC, there's a ton of stuff happening on the web, or we've got a partnership with Snapchat, or, you know, there's just, so I think if you're young and ambitious and you work hard, there are ways in sort of up the ladder a little bit where maybe you don't have to go to that tiny town and wait 20 years to get where you want to go. So long answer, but believe it or not, that was the short answer. <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, th thanks for the long, short answer. You know, it's abundantly clear from that you have this, this mountain of experience and all, all these things you've seen and done over the years. What, in your opinion at this point, do you think makes for a successful morning show? Like, what, what are the, the hallmarks? What are the things you need that, that you find really resonate? Well, I think in the day and age where everybody already knows everything because they woke up and read it on their phone, you have to offer some added value to it. So, so what, do you, what does your show give me that I'm not getting everywhere else? In my case, it's 10 minutes with Bill Murray in a conversation that you might not hear somewhere else. Um, and so I think, you know, you can't be a show that's all things to all people because you got to know what your thing is. What do you do? And our thing has become, in some ways, this long form interview that we do every week. Um, Morning Joe knows exactly what it is. It's a political show. And it's like, I always tell people, it's like, they're like, you didn't do this international news story. And it's like, well, Sports Center didn't do the soccer highlights from India today either because like they're doing sports and we're doing American politics and we're covering the White House. And so know who you are, know your audience. Your audience isn't going to be as big and broad as it used to be, but they're going to be intense and they're going to stay with you and you might get more people when the news heats up. So I think you have to know your, know your show, know your audience and be hyper-focused on whatever your thing is. Um, because you can't do that big umbrella. We're a little of this. We're a little of that. It's like, why? Do, I don't need to watch that. Yeah. I want all of that or all of that. You know. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, Willie, I, much like you and Bill Murray, I could sit here and talk to you for hours, man. <laughs> I know. I, I, I got to let you go. I hope you rap. had a good time, dude. I had a blast. Awesome. That's that's good to hear. I'm gonna go drink some Drambuie now. Please do. Let's yeah. pour two out. Uh, everybody, a reminder. Uh, Sunday today with Willie. When's it on? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. And the Sunday Sit Down podcast available as on Apple Podcasts. Everywhere the podcasts are, you can get it right now. We, by the way, we've got Damian Lewis this week from oh, Billions amazing. and Homeland, and he's amazing. So he's amazing. our guest. Fantastic this week. guys, make some noise, please. Willie Geist, everybody. Thank Come you. on. Guys.